Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay, boys. Next episode of the 30 Years War series from Kings and General. Generals. Uh, Rock Roy. Rock Qua. Uh, that, that was the last episode. I just went through the ending a little bit. It was... And immediately jogged my memory. Um, this, the French were lured into this really bad trap for the French through this narrow forest path. And the Spanish had a perfect defensive position and it seemed it looked like it was going to be a spanish slaughter of the french but they ended the french ended up sending cavalry around the right to attack parts of um and it just didn't seem like the spanish army was moving much it just seemed like a botched um failure uh more than just a uh great french victory and maybe it was both let's do it if you're new to the channel, hello, my name is Connor. I like to learn about history through YouTube recommendations. The original link to the video will be at the top of the description below. Right under that will be the link to the Discord. I'd love for you to join. Pull up a chair. Join the family. We're nice, usually. Most most of the time. We're nice. Just create that atmosphere. Watering hole. Water bubbler. Makes it easier for me to interact with you. Let's do it. Okay. If you're not ready to learn, get out. There's the door. You're in the wrong class. Homac is down the hall. Or just chill. That's fine, too. Let's go. Was I... No. All right. Ready. The French have decisively won at Roquois, and that has swung the Rock pendulum Roy. of the <laughs> Thirty Years' War yet again. Their Swedish allies, commanded by Torstensson, have recovered from their earlier Gustavus. defeats and are now attacking the heart of the Holy Roman Empire, advancing further than even their legendary king, Gustavus Adolphus. But is that enough to Died end a hero. the war? The Battle of Freiburg is going to prove that... Can I just say something? So I was trying to look in between... Like I said when I started this whole series, this is one of those topics where not only do I know so little about, I'm learning more, but it's like in a sea of other conflicts, adjacent conflicts that I also know so little about. And so I feel it like it's easier for me to understand a topic I am very ignorant about when I at least know part of what's going on in adjacent uh, conflicts. Not necessarily um, an area, just like in time, like before or after. And I really don't, but um starting to do somewhat well but i have been researching a bit and some of the related conflicts are the uh like the 80 years war i guess this conflict between the french and the spanish i think goes on a bit longer so yeah i would love to learn about you know the kind of gap i have between the 30 years war once i finish this and the seven years war going on to the napoleonic wars so in between then if you guys have any good videos or playlists, I would love to tackle that next. Let's go. More blood has to flow. Shout out to Brilliant for sponsoring this I'm going to let it play. At least I can We're do We're happy to be partners with Brilliant as this educational platform and our channel share similar values. Do you know someone who likes to ask, how does the refrigerator work? Or how do I solve this puzzle? Or maybe even, what is quantum computing? If so, we've got just the thing for you. Spread the love of knowledge and learning to your loved ones by gifting them Brilliant. This really excites us because it's such a fun way to nurture curiosity, build confidence, and develop problem-solving skills crucial to school, job interviews, or their career. Brilliant thought-provoking content breaks up complexities into bite-sized, understandable chunks that will lead them from curiosity to mastery. Go to brilliant.org slash kingsasgenerals and grab a gift subscription Check it to out. help your loved ones finish their day a little smarter. Anyone who pays, gives kings and generals money is uh, someone who I like. He deserves it. Or they. was one of the most serious defeats the Habsburgs Rock suffered Roy. during the Thirty Years' War. It now the Habsburgs, sorry. defeat the Habsburgs suffered during the Thirty Years' War. It now seemed that nothing could stop Conde from taking over the Spanish Netherlands, as his opponent, Jean de Beck's Spanish army, was much smaller than that of the French prince. 
However, the Spanish Netherlands was a country of many dozens of fortified cities, so all Beck needed to do was reinforce the city Condé was going to attack. The latter went for Thienville, in the hopes of cutting the Spanish Netherlands from the Habsburg territory to the south. Beck managed to sneak in reinforcements before Condé besieged Thienville on June 16, 1643. This allowed the city to withstand a two-month siege. The campaigning season was coming to an end, so Condé abandoned the siege and returned to France. The leader of the Dutch Republic, Frederick Henry, attempted to advance from the east, but Beck successfully bluffed him into thinking that the Spaniards received fresh troops, which forced the former to retreat. Despite this minor improvement in the situation, it was clear to the Spanish king, Philip IV, that the situation in the Netherlands was untenable. He needed all his troops to fight off the uprisings in Portugal and Catalonia, so Beck would get no help. Suchet. Philip also basically broke his alliance with his Habsburg cousin, Ferdinand III, and started peace negotiations with the Dutch Republic. Back west, the Swedish commander Torstensson was slow to exploit his recent decisive victory at Breitenfeld. In November of 1642, he besieged Leipzig and sent Königsmark towards Westphalia to distract the imperial forces in that area. The fall of Leipzig a month later was a serious blow to the elector of Saxony, John George. Torstensson's troops took Chemnitz in late December and started marching towards the crucial fortress of Freiburg, besieging it in early 1643. Meanwhile, the loser of the Battle of Breitenfeld, Archduke Leopold Wilhelm, had returned to Vienna, leaving his army under Piccolomini to be reformed at Reconitz. The latter was incredibly effective, and by January had 14,000 men to Vienna of the Battle of Breitenfeld, Archduke Leopold Wilhelm had returned to Vienna, leaving his army under Piccolomini to be reformed at Reconitz. The latter was incredibly effective, and by January had 14,000 men available to help Freiburg. Indeed, Piccolomini's advance towards the fortress forced Torstensson to go in. I love that name. Piccolomini. ...into winter quarters. Piccolomini returned to Bohemia and was inexplicably removed from command in favor of Gallus. The campaign the was music. renewed in late March as Torstensson attempted to invade Bohemia. A long series of maneuvers, marches and countermarches between his army and that of Gallus began and ran well into October, when Torstensson was able to reach Brunn and raided the area. His hope was that he might receive support for an attack from the largely Protestant Transylvania. Simultaneously, the Swedish commander sent a force under Konigsmark to raid Franconia and then Saxony, in hopes that it would force the Imperials to divide their forces, while Gallus ordered Krokov to march into Pomerania via Brandenburg to weaken Sweden's hold over the region. Supported by a small Polish detachment, Krokov managed to take a few settlements. Gallas decided to reinforce him with cavalry under Puckheim, but Torstensson was able to destroy that group around Troppau. At the same time, Konigsmark was commanded to engage Krokov, and by the end of September, the Imperial force was pushed into neutral Poland. Back in Moravia, Torstensson, who didn't get any help from Transylvania, lost all of his momentum besieging Jagendorf, and as Oxenhuena was planning to invade Denmark, he called the commander back north. Despite being Protestant and starting the Thirty Years' War on the same side, Denmark and Sweden were natural rivals. The success of Sweden made Danish king Christian IV increase the tax for trade passing through the strait. Denmark and Sweden were natural rivals. The success of Sweden made Danish king Christian IV increase the tax for trade passing through the straits. Word leaked out that the Danes were negotiating an alliance with the Habsburgs, and that made the conflict that would later be known as the Torstensson War inevitable. 
Oxenfenner's plan was for Marshall Horn to attack from the north Wait, inevitable. And that what? made the conflict that would I'm later be known as dating a trade excess of Sweden. <sighs> God. I'm trying my best. I really am. So, when did Denmark switch? Um, I was doing so well, and then this just so Sweden is doing very well. I didn't know Sweden was this strong at at any point, really. I I, I didn't know much about the history. Of Sweden, but I I didn't know that they were this strong taking on all of these armies in um on mainland Europe. And obviously, I've learned that they have a big beef with Denmark. But so Denmark is is getting worried about how well Sweden is doing, and and I, I'm not saying that that that's unwarranted. You know, my neck. I'm not saying that that's unwarranted. But w what I was so confused is I thought. Christian the fourth of Denmark, Christian of Denmark was against the the Catholic um, my my ego just got smashed more than it was. I almost feel like I want to go back like two episodes. So when did Denmark switch sides? Did they are they just switching sides tonight? So I get it. They're they're afraid. There, have a big rivalry with Sweden. I'm getting frustrated now. They have a big rivalry with Sweden, and so Sweden's doing very well, and they're going to undoubtedly have a lot of influence and ending up maybe threatening Denmark with all the influence they have in northern mainland Europe. I'm not saying that's unwarranted, and so he's trying to weaken them a bit, and it's going to lead to a war, but I, I just, I don't, I, I'm, I'm having trouble understanding when... Denmark went to the Catholic side. I Denmark and Sweden were net off. Thirty years war on the same side. Denmark and Sweden were natural rivals. The success of Sweden made Danish King Christian IV increase the tax for trade passing through the Straits. Word leaked out that the Danes were negotiating an alliance with the Habsburgs, and that made the conflict that would later be known as the Torstensson War inevitable. I feel like such an idiot. I, I, I feel like I missed something huge. And that's what's... I, I, I hate going forward in a video when I, I, I don't know everything that's going on, at least in the short term, but I feel like this is something that I must have missed. A few videos back. Oxenhuis, that would later be known as the Torstensson War, inevitable. Oxenhuis's plan was for Marshal Horn to attack from the north, Admiral Fleming to secure the Baltic Sea, and Torstensson to strike Jutland from the south. I just want to, sorry, just um, continue. This, this has been the most, out of all of the things so far, all of the videos, history, uh, conflicts I've learned about, this has been the most difficult to follow. Although Torstensson feared that his absence would allow Gallus to take back Silesia, Moravia and Saxony, he strengthened the fortresses in the area and publicly announced that he was retreating to Pomerania in order to confuse the enemy. The march north started in mid-November, and in late November he entered the Danish holdings in Holstein. Torstensson occupied a number of fortresses. That's you guys. Your comments show up on my phone. That was your fault. Danish holdings in Holstein did in mid-November. And in late November, he entered the Danish holdings in Holstein. Torstensson occupied a number of fortresses, and by January 20th, 1644, the Swedes were ready to invade Jutland. Leaving some troops to besiege Gluckstadt, Torstensson moved the rest to the narrow channel separating the mainland from the island of Funen while Horn took the provinces of Halland and Scania, save for Malmo. Sweden Both must just Swedish sweep generals them. needed Fleming to win the naval battle to take the Danish capital, but Christian took command of the fleet and defeated the Swedes in a number of naval engagements between February and July, they need most to do importantly stuff. at Kolbera Haida, in the aftermath of which Fleming was killed and the Swedish fleet was blockaded at Kiel. 
Simultaneously, Imperial commander in Westphalia, Hatzfeld, began threatening Torstensson from the southwest, and Gallus appeared from the southeast in July. The Swedish commander left Vraniel to secure Jutland and advanced south rapidly with what troops he had, using scorched earth tactics while retreating back to his initial positions. Gallus's troops suffered from the lack of supplies, and he wasted months worried that the Swedes might cross the Elbe. At the same time, Konigsmark was sent... I wonder if they've ever had... Because Scorched Earth is such a common tactic in, in warfare, no matter what the time uh, I've learned. And I wonder if there's ever been a point where, like, a soldier was trained or, like, specific job was to just go ride somewhere and where the, an enemy is, an, is approaching and just torch everything. Hold on, I just want to... ...the Swedes might cross the Elbe. At the same time, Konigsmark was sent south, drawing away Hatzfeld. The caution the Imperial commanders employed played against them, as Sweden entered an alliance with the Dutch, and their united navies finally defeated Christian at Fiemann, crippling the Danish navy in the process. Although no major battles were fought Dutch between the, the Swedes and the Imperials in 1644, Gallus's mismanagement, famine, desertions, and plague reduced his troops to a few thousand, and the Habsburg army basically ceased to exist. An alliance between Sweden and Transylvania was signed, with the prince of the latter, George I Rakotsi, was eager to support Torstensson's march against Vienna. However, we need to leave Torstensson for now and focus on the events in the west. Okay. The defense of the Holy Roman Empire in the Rhine region was mostly left to the Elector of Bavaria, Maximilian I, and his army, commanded by Franz von Mercy, managed to effectively destroy the French army under Ranso at Tuttlingen on November 24, 1643. This balanced Tuttlingen on November 24, 1643. This balanced the decisive French victory at Roquois and gave Bavaria the initiative. After wintering in the area, Mercy took Überlingen in May and then besieged Hottenwil, planning to starve it out. This gave the new French commander of the theater, Henri Turenne, time to organize his forces. Although he had 10,000 troops, mostly made up of Germans from Weimar, against 20,000 commanded by Mercy, Turenne crossed the Rhine on June 1st in two columns. By June 4th, Turenne was at Hüffingen, and even defeated a small Bavarian detachment. Despite that, the French just didn't have enough troops to fight and started their retreat. Mercy left a small group to continue the siege and moved to the west, besieging Freiburg on the 26th while Turenne set a camp at Benzenberg and started a series of skirmishes, killing a few hundred Imperial soldiers. However, all that was in vain, as Freiburg fell on the 29th. It seemed that all the French gains of 1638 were about to be reversed. So the main protagonist, or the main... So it's the French, the Dutch, the Swedes against the Bavarians, you know, the Habsburgs, Habsburgs in Spain, and then there is Denmark. Okay. It seemed that all the French gains of 1638 were about to be reversed. Yet, the French Prime Minister... I don't care if that sounded stupid, all right? I'm trying to learn Adieu here. Mazarin ...had another idea. Duke of Orléans, Gaston, was assigned to lead the army in Flanders, and Condé was sent to the Rhine Theatre and appointed as the commander of the German army. His 10,000 marched towards Turenne, reaching him on August 2nd, just 13 days after the appointment. As Mercy was forced to leave small detachments at Freiburg and Hottenwil, he now had 17,000 troops. I'm going Condé back. Was set the floor about to be reversed. Yet, the French Prime Minister, Cardinal Mazarin, had another idea. 
Duke of Orléans, Gaston, was assigned to lead the army in Flanders, and Condé was sent to the Rhine Theatre and appointed as the commander of the German army. So the Germans? This war is crazy. So the Germans, under French command, fighting with France against the Bavarians. Austrians kind of Habsburg. His 10,000 marched towards Turenne, reaching him on August 2nd, just 13 days after the appointment. As Mercy was forced to leave small detachments at Freiburg and Hottenwil, he now had 17,000 troops against 20,000 under Conde. Mercy probably knew that the usually rash Conde was going to attack directly, and he also lacked horses, which made a retreat difficult. So he started creating a fortified position to the southwest of Freiburg, an area that was favorable for this tactic, with its river valleys, hills, and forests. The Schoenberg Hill, which was impossible to form a line formation on, was central in this plan. Mercy's north was secured due to the river Dreisen, while on his right flank, his troops erected a line of palisades from Haslach to the western slopes of the Schoenberg Hill, further defended by the Moosewald Forest to the west. A sconce and a star fort. One sec. were placed on by the Moosewald Forest to the west. A sconce and a star fort were placed on the western edge of the hill to make scaling it even more costly. These fortifications that could have put the likes of Julius Caesar to shame were manned by five infantry regiments, 4,000 or so soldiers, supported by five guns. The imperial left was made up of 1,000 or so footmen, but that was enough, as they were defending a narrow passage, the Bandstein, between Schoenberg Hill and another forest to the east. That pass was also blocked by obstacles, but in general, it wasn't expected that the French were going to attack here, as bypassing Schoenberg would have their left flank open to attack. A small group was stationed on top of the hill to coordinate the two wings divided by the hill. The majority of the Imperial troops, some 12,000, stayed in the main camp to the south of Haslach. The French knew of these preparations. Turenne and Condé argued on the best course of action, and this was the precursor of the debates that would happen within the French military community for the next decades and centuries. Turenne was advising not to engage Mercy's remarkable position directly and to move north and then west, cutting the imperial supply line to the north of Freiburg, which would have forced the Bavarian commander to retreat east, leaving his rear vulnerable to the charges of the superior French cavalry. However, Condé was in charge, and he believed that the Bavarians could be defeated with a frontal attack, so he overruled Turenne and other generals and ordered a direct assault on the 3rd of August. Turenne was sent to reconnoiter the enemy defences and found the Bandstein Pass. He was instructed to advance here with 5,000 footmen, while Condé would command 5,000 infantry and a few hundred cavalry against the Imperial right. 3,000 or so horsemen defended the left side of Condé's forces, and a few guns were set up on a small hill behind his positions, with the rest of the army in reserve between the two French commanders. The attack was to start at 5 p.m., which was another controversial decision. Turenne's forces had to march for hours before the fight, which tired them, and it was just hours before sunset, meaning that the French had mere hours to win the battle. Condé's offense started from the village of Ebringen against the village of Bourne. This was the weakest link in the imperial fortifications, since other redoubts weren't able to assist directly, and the French led by Espinard were able to overcome the wall despite enemy fire. Scaling the walls broke their formation, however, and the imperial fire on the other side of the wall forced Condé's forces to retreat down the hill. 
next group up. This time, the French leader ordered Despinon to attack the southeast portion of the wall, with Tonon being sent against the southwest. Once again, the wall was taken, and once again, the French were greeted by Bavarian fire. Despinon's already battered troops weren't able to resist for long. Most of them retreated downhill, while a group under Persson dispersed in the forest to the east. Soon, Tournon's units, who were disheartened by the Allied rout, fell back to Ebringen. The French were taking heavy casualties, but not nearly enough to change Condé's mind. The French general ordered a third attack, leaving only cavalry... I wonder if they got any of the, uh, the defenders. The French general ordered a third attack, leaving only cavalry in reserve. For the third time, his troops surmounted the walls. However, this time, Bavarian cannons further north were finally turned and used against them, killing many. On the other hand, the defenders of Bull were running low on ammunition, and the troops... How good aim do you have? Because they seem pretty close, and that cannon isn't that close. Could you friendly fire, maybe? Left hand, the defenders of Bull were running low on ammunition and the troops, led personally by Condé, reached and attacked them. Simultaneously, Persson's regiment surprisingly managed to reform in the woods and joined the fight against the Imperial defenses from Good the on east. The defenders were overwhelmed and slaughtered. Well done, honestly. Round Meanwhile, of applause. That guy fight. who got routed into the woods was able to get his people together again and charge. ...reached its position earlier than... Meanwhile, Turenne's flank reached its position earlier than expected, headed by a vanguard of 1,000 musketeers under Roque Servier. Mercy's outpost sent word of their approach and informed the commander. Turenne probably knew that he was facing a minor force and attacked at 4.15 p.m., eager to break Hurry. his foe before they Hurry. were reinforced. Hurry. The initial French advance pushed the defenders back. But Mercy, who considered this attack to be more dangerous than the one that was being openly prepared by Condé, arrived in time with 5,000 soldiers to push Roxervier back, wounding the French leader in the process. Turenne's situation was bad. He had the numerical advantage, a cavalry reserve and artillery nearby, but wasn't able to use any of that due to the narrowness of the passage. Furthermore, what is the, on Schoenberg? Is there a letter before the sea? Isn't that like a rifle on there? What is that, like one sniper up there? What does that represent? He had to attack immediately in order to tie up enough of Mercy's forces to give Condé's attack a chance. So he moved to the front line and led the offense himself. With no room to maneuver and use their advantages, the French were suffering heavy casualties but continued to fight. At that moment, Condé's troops once again were moving north, this time to take Sternschanzer. Reuschenberg, who was left in command by Mercy, mustered 2,000 and moved south to reinforce the redoubts on Schoenberg. Ooh, this the is... two sides skirmished for an hour, but Reuschenberg, who clearly was a weak commander, decided that he couldn't defend the position without the southernmost defenses and had to retreat to the main camp. Condé, what are you doing, man? You gave up that easily? Yeah, they had the numbers, but you, you had the fort. And had to retreat to the main camp. Condé, Fired. ever an opportunist, would have followed, but his troops were in terrible shape, and it was now dark and raining, so he called it a day after taking Sternschanzer. The French now controlled Schoenberg, mostly due to Condé's personal bravery. To the west, the dogged fighting continued until 4 a.m., when Mercy was informed that the hill was lost. This meant that his rear might be open to an attack, so the Imperial commander disengaged and moved back to the camp. What a badass. He led his, uh, the French guy led his troops, I'm terrible with names, led his troops uh, in the front, didn't, up, uh, didn't end up dying, and uh, held them off for enough time for them to retreat. Yes. Nice leaving Turenne in control of the passage. The French lost almost 3,000 troops on this day, most of them on Turenne's flank. Imperial casualties were around 1,000. 
On August 4th, using the fact that Condé's army was exhausted, Mercy moved his army to the east and ordered his troops to create another line of defense based around the hills of Loreto and Gipfel. The Imperials were now defended by the Dreisum to the north and east, with Freiburg providing cover for their northern flank. Most of their infantry was on the hills, with the rest... I just say, I'm sorry to the Spanish, but it does... And if I'm wrong, sorry, I'm wrong. I'm not saying this from like, oh, it's a fact. It should, my opinion can be changed, but the... Out of all of the people in the different coalitions, all of the all of the nations, empires, whatever you want to call them, it seems like the Spanish are the least well-led. Is that, you think that's fair to say? The, uh, Gustav has died, but still, Sweden, um, doing extremely well, it shows how well their, good, uh, their soldiers are, but... Maybe Spain was more of a navy-based power at this point. I mean, it's the mid-1600s. They must still be a pretty big power. The French seem very competent. Swedes very competent. The rest of the footmen and cavalry in reserve near the village of Adelhausen. And Teal was As good was on... there was parity in the number of troops for both sides, Mercy was sure of victory. Conde took I, them I missed that. with the rest of the footmen and cavalry in reserve near the village of Adelhausen. As there was now parity in the number of troops for both sides, Mercy was sure of victory. Conde took the main imperial camp on the same day, while Turenne positioned his troops in Mertzhausen. This the is a, this is deja vu of Rockroy. Roqua. I like Rockroy. And I bet you the same result will happen. The Spanish will lose despite having... I mean, it doesn't seem to be as, as at more advantageous as the last, as Rock Roy, Rock Roqua, but um, let's see. ...day to rest and Turenne positioned his troops in Mertzhausen. The French used the day to rest and tend to the wounded. There was still no agreement between their commanders as Turenne wasn't eager to go on another frontal attack. Get that Condé, armor. however, was sure that Mercy's retreat on the third was a rout, and that the fortifications on the hills were a bluff. The commander devised a plan to take the fortifications. His troops would charge up the Loreto Hill and tie up as many enemies to what does he mean? that wasn't needed. There was still no agreement between their commanders, as Turenne wasn't eager to go on another frontal attack. Conde, however, was sure that Mercy's retreat on the third was a rout, and that the fortifications on the hills were a bluff. The commander devised a plan to take the fortifications. I don't think so. His troops would charge up the Loreto Hill and tie up as many enemies as possible, while Turenne was to use the cover of the Becker Wood to cover his advance and then take Vornhalder, which would make the defense of the hills untenable and give the French victory. The French attack think. was supposed to start at 8 a.m. on the 5th of August, yet Condé and Turenne were suddenly informed of movement to the south of Von Halder. Both commanders rode to their extreme right to personally scout the situation, as the Imperial presence in the area would mean that Turenne's right flank might be in danger and their plans no, They don't included. trust anyone else. However, Despinon, who was to command the French movement towards the Loreto Hill, didn't receive news of that, and his troops were too close to Mercy's forward redoubts. A group of dismounted dragoons was defending this position, and they opened fire at the advancing French. Although this wasn't the position Despinot had to attack, he ordered a unit to take it. In response, Mercy reinforced the redoubt. This doesn't Despinot look good for had France. to send in even more reinforcements, and the battle started. Lachelle's musketeers, tasked with taking the Becker Wood, thought that it was the signal to attack. But the Bavarian troops were still not distracted, so most of the Frenchmen who exited the forested area were killed on sight. Dormont, who had to charge here, moved forward Wait, in am I an idiot? Are these Bavarians and not the Spanish? Oh, I'm such an idiot. All right, Bavarians. But right? immediately was greeted by imperial volleys. Or both? The French were stopped in their tracks. 
the Imperials then counterattacked, pushing Dormont downhill. Conde, who was returning to his flank from reconnaissance, concentrated nearby forces and charged the advancing Bavarians, driving them away. The French commander then took over the troops of Dormont and moved against the enemy position at Von Halder. This attack was met by overwhelming musket and cannon fire, killing and wounding many Frenchmen, missing Condé only by chance. Luckily for the retreating Condé, the French center, led by Turenne, attacked the center of the imperial fortifications, which forced Mercy to reinforce this position and allowed Condé and Despinon to disengage. The French lost more than a thousand in that encounter battle, while Mercy's casualties were less than 300. Once again, Condé wasn't discouraged and ordered another attack. This time, Turenne was going to divert enemy attention to the south, while Despinard would take Loretto Hill. This assault began at 3 pm. The French managed to scale the northern hill, but were promptly treated with bullets and cannonballs and were forced to fall back. The second wave was able to get closer to the redoubts, but once again was forced to run. The same fate awaited the third and fourth French waves stubbornly sent uphill by Condé. The French commander decided to add another element to his attack. The third and fourth waves reformed and attacked the enemy fortifications from the west, while the dismounted dragoons, whose armor was heavier than those of the footmen, charged the Loretto Hill from the north. Initially, that worked as intended, with the Bavarians being pushed back and losing the redoubt. However, Mercy had his own cavalry reserve, and it was sent forth to attack the French dragoons from the right. This stopped the French advance. Condé attempted to turn the tide by sending his last reserves into the fray, but that was countered by Mercy's last reserves. This was a desperate fight. Slowly but surely, the Bavarian well done by the Bavarians, but also poorly done by the French. Started to gain an upper hand and pushed the French downhill. Luckily for Condé, Turenne still had some cavalry reserves, and they moved left, blocking the Imperial pursuit. These horsemen defended the French footmen until nightfall. Condé lost another 2,000 men, bringing the total of his losses to 8,000, almost half of his army. The third day of the battle was the deadliest for Mercy, with more than 1,000 killed or wounded. Overall, he had lost 2,500 through three days of battle. Condé and Turenne spent the 6th fortifying their camp worried that Mercy, who now outnumbered them, was going to attack, but the latter proved to be too cautious, or maybe his army was also too battered to attack. Condé's bravery that gave him the brilliant victory at Roquois was perfectly countered by Mercy, whose defensive strategy changed the balance of power in the war once again. But was that enough to save the Empire? We will find out in the coming videos in this series, which will be released soon, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. I had to pee so bad at the end of that. Um, I'm an idiot, yeah, for, I, I'm, I got confused, there's so many different sides, and the Spanish and the Bavarians were the same color, even, excuses, I, I should have known that. Uh, sorry for, uh, crapping on, uh, no, actually you still kind of deserve it. Awesome. Awesome video. I got a pee so bad. Uh, see you guys next time with the next one. Hope you're doing well. Like, subscribe, all this stuff. Battle of Jankow. Probably mispronouncing that again. See you guys next time.